Hey guys, I'm back. Uh, for those of you guys who don't know or haven't been following Chess Summit, I've been in Europe for the last three months. I left on February 7th, 2017, and I finally arrived uh, late last week on April 28th, 2017. So that was a total of 82 days. Uh, on the other side of the pond, I was playing in five different tournaments, and I was spent time in seven different countries. As you can see here on the map that I've put out for you guys, I landed in Germany, and then I went through Austria, Czech Republic, went back through Germany, then I visited Italy, did Austria again, played a tournament in Hungary, and then before heading back, I visited Paris for a little bit and then played in the Reykjavik Open. So I've attached a few pictures for you guys here. Um, the top left photo is from Salzburg, and then across from that's Duomo. You guys, I'm sure, recognize the Eiffel Tower. Um, the nice kind of dome-looking uh, picture is from the inside of the Natural History Museum in Vienna. And then there's a picture of me in Florence, and of course, uh, Kosti and I getting a photo with Anish Giri and Sipiko Gurumishvili, uh, Miss Tactics on Chess24. So a quite action-packed trip for me, definitely. Uh, definitely an unforgettable experience, to say the least. I actually also happened to do really well on the chessboard, thanks to a lot of pre-trip prep. I, again, played in five different tournaments. My FIDE rating started at 1882, and now at the conclusion when everything's been rated, I'm sitting at 2068. So that's a 186-point gain across three months. Of course, I wasn't exactly 1800 strength to begin with, but um, needless to say, I think that that kind of exceeded my own personal expectations of how much I could gain in five tournaments. Uh, you know, obviously playing in the U.S. where you play all these youngsters who are, who are really underrated. Um, in Europe, you really don't have that, so it's a lot easier to gain points. And also my USCF rating got a nice jump. I finally made it back over 2100 at the conclusion of the Bad Boy Chopin. Open in Germany, and with two tournaments set to go, it looks like I'll get about another 60 points. So hopefully, that'll be the highest ever USCF rating I have, and I'll get me that much closer to my goal to making National Master here on Chess Summit. So, I want to apologize first. I usually like to get my posts out a little bit earlier, um, but after I got back, I decided that I wanted to visit my high school, Maggie O. Walker Governor's School. For those of you guys who don't know me as well or who are new to Chess Summit, um, one of the things that really got me going with chess was that I coached the National High School Chess Championship winning team in the under-1200 section back in 2014 in San Diego, and that was my high school, and that's kind of how Chess Summit all began. And so I decided that, okay, uh, yesterday was going to be about the team, and today's going to be about Chess Summit. So here I am with my post today, a little bit late, I know, um, but hopefully you guys can forgive me. I have some interesting things to talk about. Um, usually I like to do a tournament wrap-up at the end of each tournament, but for those of you guys who don't know, I did a videos after each round with International Master Kostya Kavitsky, um, in which I thought they were pretty instructive. We went over every single game that we played, regardless of win-loss or draw or how well we played, and we talked about just the different things that we learned through each game. I learned a lot actually being there and recording with Kostya, and I hope that you guys can learn a lot too, both watching how I think and how someone about 400 rating points stronger than me thinks. Um, so I think that that was definitely an interesting experience. Kostya has been, of course, posting on Chess Summit throughout the way. And you can find those videos on his YouTube channel, Kostya Kavitsky, on YouTube. So I figured maybe not necessarily uh, going over my tournament in great depth. Maybe I'll talk about it a little bit today. Um, but I thought it would be more fun to do like a superlatives video uh, and talk a little bit more about my trip since a lot of people have been asking me questions about like what's Europe like and all of this. Not so much on the chess side. Of course, there will be a little bit of chess in today's video. So uh, that's coming up for sure. So... I think the question I get asked the most is what city did I enjoy the most? And I would have to say, hands down, it was Vienna. Um, there's just something about Vienna that combines um, the history with like a modern sense of architecture. And it really feels like a place where everything is integrated. I felt like of all the cities that I visited, um, I, could use, I could make the best adjustment and feel like I was living in Vienna uh, against all the other cities. Um, one thing I really tried to do this trip is I tried to integrate myself with the local people and maybe stay away from the tourist crowd, with the exception of Reykjavik. Um, and that really helped me kind of get a sense for good foods. And whatnot. I talked a little bit about this in my article, my fourth article while I, while I was starting my tournament in Budapest, about how important it is to um, try to get a sense for food culture and all this. And there were a lot of little historical notes I learned along the way, thanks to trying to integrate with locals. I would say second favorite city was probably Florence in Italy. Um, I met some people there that were really nice, but it was also a fun city to go visit because it felt like there were a lot of things to do, but it didn't have like the grungy feel of like a New York City or a Philadelphia. So that was 
um, that was definitely a good highlight for me. And of course, I really enjoyed my time in Reykjavik, but that was more of a tourist and as a tournament player than uh, going to go out and you know see the natural sites. I, I wish I could have, but it was just the scheduling with the tournament. I probably could have stayed a couple days afterwards, um, but I got to meet a lot of people on the U.S. team as well as some international superstars, as you can see below, Anna Shkiri. Um, so that was definitely something else. As someone who hasn't actually gotten to go see these super tournaments live before, so I enjoyed playing in the Reykjavik Open as a spectator, but also as a tournament player um, myself. I'm hoping that maybe at some point, you know, I'll go see a Grand Chess Tour event or something like this. But it was definitely a treat to go play in Reykjavik along, you know, such such big players. Um, what was the biggest lesson that I learned this trip, chess wise? So. One thing that I found was even though these tournaments are nine, ten rounds, just like in a U.S. tournament, it feels like there will reach a point in a tournament where everything hinges on one game. And one thing that I found was because my FIDE rating was really low, I would play up a lot, basically the equivalent of being an underdog in the U.S. So, you know, I would usually start out with these tournaments two and a half out of six, two out of six, so minus one, minus two, more than midway through the tournament. And if I wanted to have a respectable finish, you know, that round seven, round eight game was always really important towards um, getting a good result and you know I think back when I was playing in the U.S. these were the kinds of games where I put a lot of pressure on myself and maybe um, that was my biggest uh, hurdle to jump over you know getting here but I found that simply um, by focusing on enjoying the tournament and having a good time I actually played better chess than you know I had previously and that was actually I actually chose a game today to kind of demonstrate that um, but I think the biggest example was my last game of the entire tour my 10th round in Reykjavik. Um, I had lost to a lower rated player in round 8. I kind of lazily won a game in round 9. Uh, probably not a deserved win. Um, but in round 10, um, you know, it was it, it was an important game for me because I needed to finish on an even score, 5 out of 10, to really be able to gain anything rating-wise. So, you know, to motivate myself to play for that game, I actually played 1e4 for the first time since 2009. I talked about that game a lot in my round 10 video with Kostya. Um, and that was uh, that that definitely got me energized, you know, going into that game, feeling like, all right, I'm going to do something I, I haven't really done before. And sometimes you need that little jolt. Uh, and the game that I'm going to show today, which I think was probably the game I played, um, the best game that I played probably in Europe the whole time. Um, this game was also a critical game because at that point in the tournament, I was two and a half out of six with three rounds to go, and I wanted to finish on as much of a plus score as possible. Um, and by winning this game, it helped me, you know, catapult get white next game, win again, and finish at plus one at five out of nine. So um, there's different points in a tournament where I feel like it's really important. You know, I feel like it's a lot easier to have a bad tournament in Europe than it is in the U.S. Because in the U.S., you know, if you, you start out and you, you only finish one and a half out of five, two out of five, you know, it's still a salvageable result. Whereas, you know, in Europe, once you start losing, everybody thinks that you're the opportunity that they have to win, especially in a round-robin format like Budapest. So I... Yeah, that was probably the biggest lesson that I learned was even though the tournament was longer, that doesn't necessarily, you know, change the overall feel. It just makes some games feel more important than others. Um, and uh, that was definitely an area I think I improved in the most. Um, probably another thing that's really important is how important it is to play practical chess. Rather than focusing on playing better, it's better to focus on playing smarter. Uh, that is in the sense that rather than trying to calculate every single move, you know, in these 90 minute plus 30 second increment time controls, it's more important to try to find the move that does the most. So um, that was something that I felt in this next game that I'm going to share uh, that I, I, I did reasonably well. So all in all, um, it was a really fun trip. Three months was a long time to be away. I am kind of happy to be back. I'm looking forward to moving back to Pittsburgh next week. Uh, but that being said, um, there are definitely a lot of other places I'm hoping to travel to at some point. So maybe that there'll be maybe there'll be a volume too, but if there is, it'll probably not be for another few years, um, if at all. So let's go ahead and get started. So for today's video, I thought rather than choosing you know my favorite game from Reykjavik like I usually do with my chess night posts, um, I wanted to choose a game that I played a few months ago that I thought was actually the best game that I played in my entire European tournament. And I decided to choose my round seven game from Bad Bad Warshofen. I'm playing an opponent from Malta. Um, and this was a really important game for me, at least, because in, let's see, round, round five, I actually drew a game where in the end game I was completely winning. I, I, I just thought that my opponent had a fortress when in reality I, I was just had a completely winning position. And in round six, maybe it was because I was frustrated with that result or, you know, I felt like because I had white I could do more. I played really aggressively and actually lost. So, 
you know, losing with white after blowing a completely one game with black um, put me at two and a half out of six. I'm not exactly happy with where I was in the tournament. And here again, I had black and, you know, I was already getting a little bit tired. I just played two other tournaments back to back before this tournament, both the Lien's Open and the Barracks tournament. So for me, uh, energy was a really important factor for this, uh, for this game. And so one of the things I talked about with my coach was, you know, I don't really think my preparation is paying off. Um, so, you know, we made a decision, all right, no more preparation for the rest of the tournament. I talked about this in my Bad Borsch Open uh, post, um, but to see this plan come to life in an actual tournament setting, this was something special. And I think that that same mentality also helped pay off in other tournaments like Reykjavik and in Budapest as well. So here I am, I've got the black pieces, I've got a limited understanding of what my opponent will play because of course I haven't done any prep. Um, I mean, all I did was I just, just checked to see if he's an E4 or D4 player and then that was it, you know, just ment mentally, you know, think about, okay, today I'm just going to play this and then that's it. So I get to the board, my opponent's already there, um, and there's like five minutes to the start of the round and I found that, you know, when I'm in the U.S., sometimes I like to get to the round you know, reasonably before 15, you know, to 20 minutes before, just mentally soak in the environment, try to get ready to, you know, play the best game I can. But one thing that I found is that I can, that can also build up stress. So for me, showing up to this game only five minutes early, you know, I was more confident, I was ready to go. This kind of helped me kind of take away that stress of getting ready for a game. You know, it's just five minutes, get your water, come back to the board, all right, let's shake hands and go. And so in this game, as I predicted, my opponent played e4, and here I'm on my own. Of course, um, to prepare for this trip, I learned 1e5 in addition to 1c5. Um, so I could play, you know, e5 stuff, but I can also play a hyper accelerated Sicilian. And I figured for today's game, based on how my previous games had gone, it was more important today to be solid, and I chose 1e5. And this was already somehow the right decision, because my opponent, uh, unlike me, decided that this game was also important, but he needed to prep for me because he had white. And so I had some games in the database where I'd played the hyper accelerated, you know, Sicilian. So he starts prepping for this line. And, you know, after the game, when we went over the game together, he was like, oh, I prepped this line for you. And he had actually prepped the most dangerous line I think there is against the hyper accelerated. Uh, don't worry, I'm not going to tell you guys, you know, I'm still hoping to be a decently competitive player. Um, but he had prepped the most dangerous line, a line that I actually hadn't looked at in a few months. And I just, and I, I just sat there and I was like, all right, I made the right decision. Being solid sometimes is more important when you're in a must-win situation. So I played 1e5. I didn't really know what he would play here because, you know, when I when I quickly looked through the database against 1e4, he had never played against 1e5. So I was like, perfect, you know, more more reason to not do prep. And he plays knight c3. Um, and I had a couple games that started this way. I had a game in Budapest that turned into a scotch. Um, that I won like this and I've also had games in the Vienna like this I had a game with the Washington International that I drew and of course I played Chess Summit's very own Grant Zhu the three-time defending Pennsylvania State Champion uh, In which I just got a completely worse position out of the opening So I had I had recently looked over some of these more sharp lines So I was prepared to play knight of six and here he played g3 and this is called the Gleck um, I haven't looked at I hadn't looked at this opening at all um, the whole trip. So at this point, I was trying to remember some ideas. And the only game that I think that I had in my working memory was a game that uh, my trainer for the U.S. Junior Open, uh, National Master Franklin Chen, had played against a Pittsburgh local uh, who was about 2,100. And I remember that that game was really instructive because Black, you know, was able to kind of like weave this net on the queen side and then just slowly get more space and win the game. So I decided to try to replicate that game to my knowledge. Um, but the w one thing I remember most of the game was against a Gleck, if you just play principal chess, it's really hard for white to get anything. So I played bishop c5, and so one of my ideas behind this move is that I want to be able to take away this option for white to play f4, because in these kinds of positions, you really don't know if white wants to play for d4 or for f4, but if he castles kingside, which this structure would suggest, um, it will be difficult for him to play f4. And, you know, I play the Botvinnik English sometimes, or I have in the past, not as much anymore, where this pawn structure, we have just the same pawns on d3 and c4, but white will never opt for this if this bishop is on c5. So I figured, okay, this is this is probably the right way to go. He plays bishop g2, I played knight c6, and he played knight g2. And now I really, you know, I'm on my own, because um, even in the game that I remember from the Gleck, white played knight at f3. And... This is considered main line, the idea being that white is just playing for d4. What white has just done by playing at g2 is he keeps this option of playing f4 open, 
And so I kind of have to guess, but I don't really think that the overall ideas for black change that much. So I just played d6, he castled, and now that he's castled, uh, I know for a fact that I really want to keep this bishop on this diagonal. So, um, and the game that I recalled, um, white played like knight a4, black dropped the bishop back, there was a trade on b6, and then after bishop to e6, this a2 pawn was a target thanks to this rook on a8. Um, and this was an idea. But now that we know that white is castling kingside and he's reserving this idea to play f4, it does make more sense to try to keep this bishop. So immediately I played this move a5. Um, so in that way, if he plays knight to a4, I do have this option of playing bishop to a7. And so rather than playing knight a4, he plays d3, which is the simple move. Okay, well his idea is still simple. He wants to play bishop g5, pin my knight, and then apply pressure through d5. So okay, h6 makes sense. He plays h3. And so now white's kind of more or less making it clear that he's ready to play f4. Uh, of course, if he had tried to play moves like King H1 and F4 now, um, there are very, uh, there are a lot of unfortunate ideas where my knight comes to G4 and the F2 and the E3 squares are really weak. The other idea being that, of course, by playing H3 here in this position, he is keeping the option open of playing Bishop E3 and F takes E3 to use this rook on the half open file. So here I actually have a really important decision because it'd be really easy. Um, to castle and just let white execute this bishop e3 idea. And I'm trying to think of all the different structures I know. And if this pawn on e5 or on c5, we basically have a weird version of a close Sicilian, which of course I have a lot of experience with by having you know many practice games with Balin. And so here I'm trying to think, I'm like, okay, well if I castle, let just, just let white execute his plan, he'll play bishop e3. And now usually in these positions when this bishop is on g7 and you have access to the diagonal, you want to put a piece on d4. But if I play knight d4, um, I would fall into a trap that Balin has executed a lot and shown in a lot of his chess summit posts, and actually I've seen him use in tournaments. And so immediately I was like, all right, um, this is this is not something I can do. So since I knew that this was a trick, I decided to play knight d4 first. The idea being that now if he plays bishop e3, he, he doesn't have as much time because I'll have c6. So like if he plays bishop e3, I don't have to castle. I'll just play c6, and now there's no knight b5, so he can't win this pawn. And of course, a trade here would be uh, not so good. So of course, bishop takes pawn takes, you know, where does this knight go? Yes, this bishop is blocked in temporarily, but once it goes back to a7, I have a nice queenside pawn spell. So this was this was my idea behind knight to d4 first. And, you know, it's, it's a pretty simple claim to the center. White decided it's better off to take, so knight takes d4. Well, okay, bishop takes d4. If I play pawn takes d4, I kind of give him this option back in the future. So he'll just move this knight back to e2 and play f4, and now this bishop is actually kind of boxed in by my own pawns. So bishop takes d4 is the only move that makes sense to me. He played knight to e2. And now I thought here for a quick second, and I was like, okay, where do I want to put the bishop? Because I could put it on b6, I could put it on c5, and I could put it on a7. And after a couple seconds, I realized that maybe b6, b6 was the best square to go. And the reason for that is when I played bishop b6, White's plan to play bishop e3 doesn't make as much sense anymore because I can play c6. This is an option I don't have with any of the other retreats. So now should white trade on b6, I'm, even though I'm giving up my dark squared bishop, I am putting a queen on that diagonal again while putting pressure on b2, and I felt like this would give me um, no problems out of the opening whatsoever. So my opponent decided it's time to break through in the center with d4. So by playing d4, he's kind of set the course for the game. There's really not going to be any more f4 ideas. And, you know, I think the game turns into a more of a strategic slugfest at this point. So I castled. He played king to h2, which kind of makes sense. But at the same time, I felt like it was kind of slow because f4 is not really on white's agenda anymore. I played rook to e8. My idea is pretty simple. I'm threatening to take and then take on e4. So he plays queen d3. I play queen e7, threatening again. My opponent played d5. I played c6. My goal is not immediately to take, but rather to keep the pressure. So when he plays this move c4, you know, if I were to take, I think white just has a simple space advantage. But I have a lot more, uh, I have a lot stronger of an idea here. And this is, I think, one of the things that I really learned on this trip was, you know, valuing practical play, you know, over intense calculation. Of course, I can calculate this line, and maybe it's not even that bad for black. Um, but there are a lot simple ways to play. And one of those is, you know, having read a lot of uh, David Brodsky's post, another author on Chess Summit, 
one of the questions that he always asks during his games is, you know, what's my worst place piece? And in this position, the answer is pretty obvious. It's a C8 bishop. You know, all of my other pieces have a function, even my A8 rook, which is simply to, you know, keep an eye open and maybe at the right moment play for A4. This bishop is actually reasonably well placed because it controls critical dark squares in the center. And okay, my queen is a little bit awkward, but it's not like there's a better place for it to be right now. And so, you know, by asking these simple questions, you know, I can just think practically rather than calculate really deep and play a move like bishop d7. This move doesn't really look like I'm developing the bishop, but the idea is simple. I want to be able to take, move my rook to c8, drop my queen to e8, and then play on this diagonal. If I can put my bishop on b5, then I actually have a lot, I've, I've posed a lot of problems for white, and this is exactly what happened in the game. So just by asking this one question, I'm actually able to change the initiative here. So white played bishop d2, I played rook e c8 before releasing the tension. My goal is to just be able to take, play queen e8, and go. Um, if I had taken first, you know, this doesn't really change that much, um, but I want to leave my options open. You know, I'm not opposed to the idea of white taking here because I can always recapture on c6, maybe play for d5, or just put pressure on e4. Of course, this also weakens the d4 square. So I thought that these structures are good for me. But in this position, I think white cracked a little bit. We were on a to e1, trying to play on the king side, maybe a move like f4. But this gave me a little bit too much. So cd5, cd5. Queen to e8, this was my favorite move of the game, uh, but actually surprisingly not the same for my coach. Um, this is, of course, a strategic great idea. Knight to c3, and my opponent thought he was holding because he's taking away the b5, uh, the b5 and the a4 squares from my bishop. But simply by using my b6 bishop, which is already on the best square it can be on, I played bishop d4, and now my idea is obvious. I'm going to take, and I'm going to put my bishop here. This, this is really strong. So my opponent played queen to f3 to get off of this diagonal. Okay, well, I better play b5. And I remember I went up, I got up, I got a water. Um, in Europe, you know, a lot of these tournaments, they have, like, concession stands for the players. And, you know, you, you pay a little bit to get, like, your soda water or your coffee or your cappuccino. And then you bring the little plate to your board. And, you know, the, it's, you know, this is kind of how it's done. So I remember I went up and got my water. I came back and I saw this move, bishop h6 on the board. And I'm like, wait, did I miss something? And I think... You know, when I had originally analyzed this move, I didn't really think about it that seriously, but of course now with it being on the board, I have to double check all my lines. Um, one of the things that I think a lot of our younger players or maybe a lot of our inexperienced players are familiar with is the mantra of checks, captures, and threats. This idea that, you know, we want to force our opponents to make moves, A, because that makes our calculation easier, but B, because it can also help change the overall shift of the position. Well, this mantra only holds true about 85% of the time, I'm guessing. Um, that's not an actual stat, but based on my own experience, I'd say 85 is a reasonable number. And the reason why is you don't have to respond to every capture, and sometimes threats are irrelevant. In this case, bishop takes h6. Of course, if I take on h6, I'm going to be in a much worse position because now my king is busted open, f4 could be coming at any moment, and my queenside pawn storm at this point is more or less irrelevant. This capture while taking a pawn isn't actually a threat, and this is what I actually had realized in my original calculation, and that's why I continue with this move before. Now, when white moves backwards, we see that this bishop is actually misplaced, it's out of the game. Bishop takes g7 is not an idea here, because the knight covers the entry squares for the queen, and so I'm still in business. So, I just played rook c2, I'm just going to activate my pieces. He plays bishop to g5, well, okay, I'm going to play knight h7, he plays bishop b3, and I take my pawn. And so at this point in the game, I had to calculate a particular line that, that happened over the board. Rook e2, rook takes e2, queen takes e2, and the question was where do I want to put my bishop? I didn't really want to trade my bishop for either of these pieces because I felt they were particularly bad. So I had foreseen this move, bishop to a3. The idea being that I'm simply making it very difficult for this knight to get on the board. So he plays knight bd2, and my idea was that after bishop b5 and knight to d3, I've activated this bishop, and I have this monster pin. So this rook and this queen could potentially be hit. So I'm simply going to keep developing, rook c8, rook d1, rook c3. And this part of the game is really easy. Um, of course, time control is at move 40, and I'd used a fair bit of time to you know, make sure that I could get to a position where I could have a plan like this. But at this point, the moves are coming out more or less pretty rapidly. And it's really important to just make sure that white has no breaks, white has no ability to create counterplay, and that white is stuck defending all of its weaknesses. So you played rook d2. Uh, not rook d2, sorry. He played bishop f1, I played bishop c4, and now he played rook d2. My idea with bishop c4 is I want to put pressure on this a2 pawn, but I also want to bring in my queen to b5. I have time to do this, of course, because white is all tied up. And by putting my queen and the bishop on the same diagonal, 
So this diagonal, I once again create pressure. And this f1 bishop can actually become a target. So he played rook d2. And here I actually do a little bit of thinking. So I saw that if he plays queen to d2, I have this idea of knight f6, f3, and then queen b5, putting a lot of pressure on this knight. And I was trying to calculate after queen f3 if I can make queen b5 work. The idea being that I'm going to win a minor piece. But I saw this tricky line for white. Knight takes e5, d takes e5, bishop takes, queen takes, uh, or rook takes, and then d6. The idea being that white has just sacked a piece to create a pass pawn, and this is actually a pretty serious threat. So I feel like when you're in control of a game like this, it's more important rather than try to win more material to just shut the game, shut the game down. So if you if you were to play queen takes queen to f3, I just play bishop takes a2, and now I have a simple alley for my pawn to go all the way. So he plays rook to d2 to make sure that this pawn is protected. I play queen to b5. Of course, now knight takes e4 e5 rather is not a threat because the queen would be hanging. So he played queen to d1, and now, this is the move that Mike Twitch thought was the best move that I played all game, knight to f6, just bringing in my last piece into the game and forcing him to play this move f3. Um, of course, this is kind of a really weak pawn structure, and it really exposes the king on the second rank. So this could potentially cause some problems for white. The game doesn't go much that, uh, that much longer. I just played this move a4. He put king g1 to get off the second rank. And then after b3, the game was more or less over. So after a takes b3, queen takes b3, um, White is basically losing by force. So should he have taken on b3, I found a really nice line here. If he plays king to f2, I played bishop takes d3, rook takes d3, and I could move this rook, but I can also play this move b2. And the idea is that simply after rook, c1, uh, rook d1, I have rook c1 exclaim. No matter how he takes the rook, I'm simply queening, and I have a pin on this bishop. So this would be simply game over. And if he were to take with the rook, I'm simply up a piece. This is, this is not hard work at all. So rook takes d3 is not that good, and I also had to calculate bishop takes d3, and the idea here is that I have bishop to c1, and I'm simply taking all of his pieces, so rook d1 and b2, and he can't hold the fort anymore, and this pawn has a simple meet and greet on the first rank. So this was a nice way to, this would have been a nice way to end the game. My opponent saw that he couldn't take on b3, and played this move queen to e2, and the game ends on a simple tactic here. This move bishop to c1. Of course, taking advantage of the fact that I have this pin. If he plays knight takes, I'm going to win his queen. And it's actually really not that simple to find good moves here anymore for white. Um, I have a lot of different ideas of being able to simply get on the first rank and then take on f1. Uh, and you know, good luck trying to find a move here uh, for, for white. For, for example, rook d1, I'm simply taking this with check. And should he take? Kablam. And this game is over. So this is a nice way to kind of get back in the groove of a tournament. You know, sometimes I feel that in order to build momentum, it's it sometimes it's more important to play well rather than to make sure to get the win. Um, I noticed this in my Budapest tournament where I think the critical moment of the tournament was actually the draw that I had with the IM um, in, in my round robin. I played him twice, I drew both times. The first time I drew him was kind of like a whoa, that, that was unprecedented. But the second time, you know, when I had black, um, that was a critical moment in the tournament, I think. And so I think it's more important sometimes to play well than to get the results. So for example, my round nine game in Reykjavik, I was very shaky. I, w I, I would hardly count that as a win in my book. Um, but to win like this, you know, this is this is the kind of chess that I think can really get you motivated to play well again. Um, I would have been really curious to see what would have happened if there was a round 11 in Reykjavik after such an emotional high of winning, you know, a game with 1e4. So I think that this is something that, you know, can definitely be taken as a critical lesson going forward in various tournaments is understanding when the critical points of your tournaments are approaching those games and being relaxed and how to build momentum in different tournaments. And that's what really carried me. You know, when I look back at some of these tournaments, um, I started in Leans two out of six. I finished four and a half out of nine. Now, granted, that's only an even score, but I was anywhere from a 200 to a 400 point underdog in FIDE rating. So, you know, okay, take what you can get. A 50 point rating game is not too bad. In Liberis, I started three out of three, but then after dropping the next two, um, I had to really claw my way back to get to a five and a half out of nine finish. So again, you know, finding, you know, critical moments in the tournament to, to change the overall trend. Um, one of the things I talked about before I went to Europe was how I was working on trends within a game. Um, that is to say, like, you get to a slightly worse position, but you have to try to fight and be resourceful enough to keep, keep the balance, keep, keep your stake in the game. Because if you just tell yourself, like, oh, I'm losing, like, this is, this is really bad, you're just going to keep making mistakes and, you, you know, you lose without your opponent actually having to have beaten you. 
Um, but this holds true with the tournament as well. You know, if you if you have some games where you lose and maybe you didn't play well or you played really well and you just blundered in the end and lost, um, this can really hurt your tournament. So it's important to find that turnaround game. You know, here in Bad Horse Show from two and a half out of six to five out of six, uh, five out of nine rather, um, that was an impressive turnaround to just get two and a half out of three, double my score within three rounds of the tournament. Um, and it's really important to find find your way. I did the same thing in Reykjavik too, actually. Three out of eight to five out of ten. You know, um, making sure to find your momentum within a tournament is a really important skill. And I'm hoping that that can help me, you know, now that I've really learned how to do it and tournaments can really help me make a push for Master. Um, so anyways, this was a slightly longer video than I would have liked, but I hope you guys were able to stay tuned. Um, I probably won't have another major tournament for a while, but we've got a lot of things going on on Chess Summit. Um, for those of you guys who haven't, you know, really been following us, Jennifer Yu has started writing the occasional post for us. That's really exciting. Of course, she just came off of a really strong U.S. Women's Chess Championship performance, and um, we're hoping to start doing streams again. Um, so definitely stay tuned for that. If you're a strong player watching our shows and you're interested in, you know, taking part of our Chess Summit Challenge, please contact me at chess.summit at gmail.com, and we'll try to set something up. So until next time, next time, this is Ken at Master Isaac Steinkamp signing off with Chess Summit.